Hi. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Thorson. I'm a planner with the Community Development Agency, and this is the second public hearing to consider the proposed stream conservation area ordinance. Um, just to quickly orient those who were not at the last hearing about the stream conservation area ordinance, this ordinance would implement countywide plan um, policy bio 4, establishing a stream conservation area setback as well as permit and um, permit criteria and required findings for permit development within the stream conservation area. The ordinance would establish a two-tier permit structure that emphasizes avoidance of development within the stream conservation area and requires that any development in the stream conservation area avoid impacts, adverse impacts to stream and riparian habitat. Um, and the ordinance would apply in unincorporated parts of Marin outside of the coastal zone. The coastal zone has its own set of policies and requirements for development near streams. So today we're hoping that um, your commission will uh, continue the public hearing and offer a recommendation on the proposed ordinance. Just to give you a little bit of context for where we are in the project schedule, um, the countywide plan policy itself uh, predates this year. It was developed through public participation and carried over from the 1994 countywide plan. Um, the current draft of the ordinance implements the policy that's been in place since 2007. And in addition to the Planning Commission hearings, we have met with numerous community organizations and neighborhood groups to present the Stream Conservation Area Ordinance and answer any questions that they may have. Um, we've also provided uh, information through a set of frequently asked questions that are provided um, as an attachment to, your, to the staff report for today. So the date uh, here, May 13th, again, we're hoping that you'll make a recommendation on the ordinance. We have tentatively scheduled this um, topic for June 18th before the Board of Supervisors, and that would also be a public hearing. Um, just quickly, again, you know, I mentioned that the Stream Conservation Area Ordinance establishes a two-tier permit structure. And um, I first want to start with the topic of standard management practices. Standard management practices um, would be required for any type of permit issued within the Stream Conservation Area. And these are implementation of design, construction, and post-construction measures um, to offset detrimental impacts to riparian habitat, um, stream water quality, and the stream channel itself. Um, stream standard management practices, or we probably will shorthand them as SMPs, um, would be required, as I mentioned, for any, any type of stream conservation area permit with a Tier 2 permit, which is discretionary, meaning that there's public notice and possibly a public hearing. Um, these could be substituted with mitigations that are determined through um, a biological site assessment specific to the development and the property. And today uh, with us um, to discuss the standard management practices, I also have uh, two of our consultants that have been helping us with this work. Dan Cloak is a stormwater engineer. He has also been working with Stop on stormwater permitting. And Justin Semyon is a biologist with the firm of WRA. He was the biologist that was primarily involved with helping us to establish the structure and content for the vegeta vegetation um, biological resources standard management practices. So uh, if there are any additional questions that you have, you know, we can feel free to call on Dan and Justin. <clears throat> The standard management practices address functions of the stream conservation area, such as stream bed and bank structure, water conveyance and flood control, um, water quality maintenance, um, riparian area and buffer function, and food web protection. Um, and I've just, it's several pages that's provided as attachment three of the staff report, but I have just summarized them here in this table. Um, what I want to point out is that from the vegetation standpoint, the standard management practices would limit removal of vegetation within the stream conservation area, especially near streams. Um, and we would require that vegetation that's um, removed be also replaced within the stream conservation area. This builds upon countywide plan um, policy and program language um, and the standard, um, sorry, the, um, the San Geronimo Valley uh, Salmon Enhancement Program, as well as other common best practices. From the runoff standpoint, the stream, the center management practices would limit new runoff to streams, and the measured, measures are based upon um, mixed stop guidance, particularly erosion and sediment control, and pollution prevention. And I, again, I'm happy to get into more specifics on this topic as we move through the hearing today. This diagram here is an excerpt from the Salmon Enhancement Plan, um, and what it's 
showing is bioretention um, in this area here. And the thing that I want to point out here is that bioretention is, um, is uh, closely integrated with landscaping. It is an engineered way to receive and disperse um, runoff, but it's uh, vegetative. Um, we, you know, with um, native plantings, it can be decorative. It can be uh, part of an overall site approach and, again, is intended to offset um, impacts from stormwater runoff going directly to a stream. So at the last public hearing, I presented this diagram to you to illustrate the top of bank um, relative to the stream conservation area in total. The area between the banks, um, so in between these red lines here, um, is subject to a creek permit per our Department of Public Works. And this ordinance really doesn't deal with that area in between the top of banks. What the ordinance um, primarily addresses is development activity within the stream conservation area setback. So the top of bank is important because it's the starting point from which we start to measure the stream conservation area setback. And at the April 1st public hearing, your commission directed us to evaluate alternatives to top of bank um, because one of the comments that came up was that it works great in a diagram such as this. It's very clear, but on the ground, it can be very difficult to determine what is the top of bank. <clears throat> so the concerns that we've heard to date uh, related to top of bank seem to primarily um, correspond to two um, stream types. And here I've labeled them terrace and V-shape or canyon profile. Um, there may be other labels, um, but for today, let's just use these. So the terrace profile is common where there is a top of bank within the active channel or where water currently <coughs> flows, but there may also be a remnant um, or an older terrace that reflects maybe where water flowed in the past, um, the historic stream channel. The V-shape or canyon profile is common in upstream areas where there's quite a bit of topography. Um, in these instances, as it was pointed out on April 1st, it can be almost impossible to determine a top of bank due to the topography of the land on either side of the stream. So here, this blue line, you see top of bank. That's what I showed you in the earlier slide. That's how top of bank is illustrated and defined in the proposed ordinance and in the countywide plan. Um, this measurement, as was noted, has no counterpart for a canyon stream. Um, the toe of the stream bed or toe of the embankment is yet another measurement that's used by the Department of Public Works in their administration of the drainage setback in Title 24. And this is a, um, roughly a 20-foot area near a stream where they will not sign off on building permits. <clears throat> The edge of what, the what did you call the toe of the stream bed toe, or toe, toe of the embankment? T O E. T O E. Yeah, like a foot. Um, here mentioned in the staff report as another option is edge of channel. Edge of channel is a demarcation that's used in the SEP um, re related to the 35 foot <coughs> distance um, for the San Geronimo Valley that's recommended for protection. And in many cases, um, the edge of channel may end up being very similar or even identical to the top of bank. Um, but where it's not easily, where the top of bank is not easily discernible, the edge of the channel could be identified using topographic data um, that we have with our um, GIS department. So it's sort of another option that doesn't necessarily require a huge amount of, of um, additional expertise. If we, if we have the topographic data, we can typically identify the edge of channel. And finally, which was discussed again on April 1st, is the center line or thread of the stream. That's the orange line here. And that is the lowest point of elevation within the stream. Um, so when we look at a stream map, uh, what it's typically depicting is not the size of the stream, but the center line of the stream is, can best be determined with the available information. Um, as I mentioned in the staff report for this meeting, the top of bank, um, which is this, the first one I showed you, is as it's defined in the proposed ordinance, it is the most consistent with the countywide plan policy by 04. However, alternatives for edge of channel or center line of stream um, could be identified for those instances where the top of bank simply cannot be identified or is not easily discernible. Another key issue that was discussed on April 1st is riparian vegetation. And um, it has two important functions within the Stream Conservation Area Ordinance. The first is 
that it can, um, the extent of riparian vegetation can result in an expanded stream conservation area setback, um, but also the extent of stream, uh, riparian vegetation can affect the applicability of the ordinance to ephemeral streams. Um, the definition that's presented here and also in the staff report is the one from the countywide plan glossary. So this is the definition that is most consistent with the plan. Um, and on April 1st, your commission directed us to also evaluate other alternatives to this definition that account for facultative species, which I could loosely describe as other important species along the stream channel that contribute to the, the function of the, the eco ecology, I guess. Um, there's more analysis provided in your staff report, but I want to briefly walk you through um, what we took a look at. Um, here in this table is a comparison. The countywide plan definition is a narrow definition. It's focused on species that are relying on um, water provided by the water course and are associated with the water course. So this can be broken down into, for example, a picture guide that shows species that are common along a water course. It is a narrow definition, which means that it may have limited applicability to ephemeral streams. So this type of a definition would not draw in a lot of ephemeral streams because, again, it would require that vegetation be associated with the water course and rely on the higher level of water provided by the water course. But from the standpoint of clarity, um, informational resources can be provided, made publicly available that allow someone to determine um, you know, with reasonable accuracy where the limits of their stream conservation area would be prior to coming in for a permit. In contrast, an approach that uh, includes facultative species or think of it as sort of a plant community-based approach um, would include riparian species and also other species that help to make up a plant community with its own distinct characteristics. This would um, be more encompassing, so it would uh, possibly draw in more ephemeral streams, um, may expand SCA setbacks more commonly, um, but it would also require a biologist to make this type of a determination. So someone who has a trained eye to discern a unique plant community in one location um, from another, maybe where there's not a clear distinction between the two. I do want to point out that it, um, vegetation removal itself is a topic that's addressed by the standard management practices. As I mentioned, those, uh, that document would um, require replacement vegetation within the stream conservation area and also limit the amount of vegetation that could be removed through a stream conservation area permit. So, the topic of vegetation is, is covered in a couple of places. Another topic that was discussed at the April 1st hearing is that of animal keeping. And the countywide plan uh, policy bio 4 states that agricultural uses should not result in animal confinement within the stream conservation area. The proposed ordinance incorporates this policy, um, but would clarify that existing permitted or legal nonconforming uses can be maintained, repaired, or even replaced. So this is um, true for a single family lot. It's true for any type of um, a use near a stream. On April 1st, uh, again, we were asked to take a look at this issue and specifically relating to equestrian facilities. Um, existing equestrian facilities, as I mentioned, could continue um, and be maintained. Facilities could be replaced even um, under the proposed stream conservation area exemptions. Um, and any new or expanded facilities would be subject to a stream conservation area permit um, like any development within the stream conservation area and um, could be approved provided that there is no adverse impact to hydraulic capacity, water quality or habitat, acreage value or function. So at this point we do not uh, suggest any special exemption for horse keeping beyond the disturbed area um, and repair, replacement and maintenance exemptions that are already provided in the draft ordinance. Next, I want to just walk you through some sort of scenarios. Um, so when we talk about the exemptions there are, and the permit tiers, I think um, it's helpful sometimes to just have a picture in your mind. And here I have several examples. So um, just to acquaint you with my diagram, this area between the blue lines is uh, a stream conservation area, and I'm, it's not to scale. <laughs> So just note that as we go through. Um, the first example of an exemption is removal of a dead or diseased tree. Um, we've, um, we've revised the proposed exemption for disturbed area, which I've shown here in gray. Um, the previous draft 
did not place any limit on new impervious surfaces within the disturbed area. It simply said development within a disturbed area is exempt. Per your direction, we narrowed that down um, to a 120-foot threshold, which is consistent with some thresholds that are already in our development code and would allow for something such as a shed um, to be placed within a disturbed area without any additional permitting. So here, number two, I've showed a shed within a disturbed area. Um, also in the exemptions is fencing. The countywide plan talks about fencing that does not prohibit wildlife access to a stream. So um, something, for example, a perimeter fence, regardless of type, that encloses a disturbed area um, would be an appropriate exemption within the stream conservation area. Note that this fence would not, um, you know, go into an undisturbed portion of the lot or restrict wildlife access along a corridor along the stream. And a second story addition um, would also be exempt under the proposed ordinance as this would not expand the footprint of the building within the stream conservation area. So some of these things may require permitting in other ways, but in terms of the stream conservation area, they would be exempt from this, the review um, for stream impacts. The Tier 1 permit, as I mentioned at our last meeting, is a ministerial permit. So much like a building permit, it would have to meet objective criteria or standards, and if it meets those standards, we would be compelled to issue the permit. There's no discretion involved. Um, here I have two examples, or yeah, I have um, just, actually this is a first example of a Tier 1 type of a project. So um, this person, uh, again, same thing, the blue um, lines represent the stream conservation area. And in this example, somebody has a pool. Um, they would like to remove some existing trees so they can get more light on their pool. Um, according to the standard management practices, then they would be required to replace that vegetation on site at a two to one rate. Here's another example. Um, and on April 1st, I, I, we discussed um, tier one permits. There was a provision in there related to building additions and a building addition of 500 square feet or less on the footprint of the structure. And it was noted at the time that um, there was no limit on the number of 500 square foot additions. So under that version of the ordinance draft, somebody could come in one year with a 500 square foot addition and then come in a couple years later and do it again. Um, we have revised that language to be cumulative so that there's really only an addition of up to 500 square feet to the footprint. But here's, I wanna walk you through how that would play out. <coughs> and then we can get into the specifics if you'd like. So in this example, somebody has, and remember I said not to scale, I'm really sorry. Um, this property owner has a 250 square foot patio, so if they were to remove that, we would be then creating, as part of the permit, a 250 square foot credit, right? They've taken off 250 square feet of impervious surface. Um, this person has in mind a building addition, so they would like to remove two existing trees and let's say for now that this is not a disturbed area. And then they propose a new addition. So the revised ordinance draft stipulates that for a tier one permit, up to 500 square feet cumulative addition to the structure um, and not closer to the stream than the existing structure. So what this does is to place a limit on the amount of new impervious surface on the lot. And um, over time, it would result in development that's further from the stream. So if somebody is taking out um, an impervious surface and establishing a credit for themselves, that development would have to be located at least as far back as the existing structure. They couldn't continue to put new development closer to the stream than the existing structure. And this, um, this applies only to building additions, which is the other thing. And then as part of their standard management practices, this person would be replacing vegetation again on site um, at a two to one rate. Now the tier two permit, um, as we discussed again on April 1st, is a discretionary permit. Oh, sorry. Yes. Actually it was on the previous one, but while you had it up there. Um, the 500 square foot addition, no closer than the existing. Yes. The one where you showed it on the side? Okay, but under the wording, it would also be conceivable that right now you have one point that comes within whatever it is, 20 feet at the top of the bank, but it would be possible to uh, build a wall parallel 
to the top of the bank at that point, right? So from a point, you'd be going to a long wall? Oh, so no closer to the stream than the existing structure, and you're saying the point of the structure that's closest to the stream? Well, that's my question. Is I thought it would allow you to go um, in a line parallel to the closest point. Oh, I see. Which would a hmm. lot, allow a lot bigger encroachment than what you um, uh, indicate in that drawing. Right. But, yeah, the language that it's drafted now would allow that. Okay. It's not limited to the area you're building on, no closer than where you're building, but it's any part of the structure. The existing structure, okay. yes. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Any part of existing legal The existing legal structure, yes, yes. Okay. All right. That, so uh, wait, uh, Commissioner Theron. Yes. <clears throat> and when the previous addition was removed, Mm -hmm. There was a 500 square foot or 250 square 250 foot addition that was feet, removed. Yes. yes. Then the closest you can be is either what the either where that addition was, or where the original house was, whichever is further away from the stream. Is whichever that right? Whichever is further from the stream, right? Okay. So the idea is that when people are building new additions, they're moving their development further from the stream than what currently exists. Thank you. I, I do have a question on that yeah. too. There's no requirement to replace in kind. So if you have like a garden shed on the side outside of your house, like a little lean-to garden shed, you could actually tear that down and convert that to living space? Um, so the proposed language for tier one is specific to additions. Additions to permitted or legal non forming structures. So if you took down a shed. But a shed attached, if you had like a little lean-to shed on the back of your the house, which it, is part of the structure, it's not detached, and you tore that down, could you build a new bedroom in that location? Well, it would have to be not closer to the stream than the existing structure right. or any structure which is removed, whatever's more restrictive. But it's not a requirement to replace in kind. No. You could tear a shed down and build a shed you could tear a shed down and build living space. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the tier two permit, um, as compared with the tier one permit, a tier one permit is ministerial, so it's a staff level review based upon set criteria. A tier two permit is a discretionary permit. Um, it would require a public notice, may require a public hearing, would involve environmental review beyond the site assessment that's identified for <coughs> Tier 1, and may require mitigation. So here I have um, an example Tier 2 project. Um, one example of a Tier 2 project would be a detached accessory structure um, larger than 120 square feet, not in a disturbed area. So re recall that um, the exemption language for a 120 square foot structure would only apply if that is located within a disturbed area. So if it's detached, it's not within a disturbed area, and or it exceeds 120 square feet, it would require an SCA permit. The Tier 1 permit is only applicable, or the Tier 1 language is only applicable to building additions. Um, the other example uh, would be a building addition where the footprint exceeds 500 square feet or it's adding more than 500 square feet to the footprint of the existing structure and or it's closer to the stream than the existing home. So again, if someone is proposing a building addition within the stream conservation area, it's exceeding that footprint threshold for the tier one level of review and it's resulting in development that's closer to the stream than the existing home, we would want to take a more um, detailed look at that through the Tier 2 permit. I'm sure that there are more questions, but I did want to keep the presentation relatively brief because I know there will be lots of public comments. And again, um, we're looking for you today to continue the public hearing and approve the resolution that uh, recommends approval of the Stream Conservation Area Development Code amendments. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, we'll go to questions, keeping in mind that we'll be going through the entire document <laughs> very carefully. So we might want to defer some of them until we get to those points in the, the document. Mr. Lubomirsky. I'd just like to follow up on the last illustration since I, that wasn't clear like the other ones were. 
by virtue of simply being there, isn't a, an accessory structure disturbed area, though? I mean, isn't the, the surrounding area to it may not be, but it itself, by virtue of existing, is. Right, sorry, I should have been more clear that that number one there, the little gray box is a new new accessory structure. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask a question on this um, schematic you've got here now. Suppose you wanted to put an addition on the front of the house, a thousand foot addition, and no more than 500 square feet of that addition was within the SCA. You, that would be eligible for tier one. Yes, as long as, long as you meet the other yeah. standards for the addition on the front side of the house, yes. setbacks, height. Yeah. So the 500 area. is the amount within the SCA yes. only. Okay. Others? Commissioner Dickinson. Um, I had a couple. And one is in the presentation you talked about um, exempt projects, tier one projects, and tier two projects. But in fact, there are, in the ordinance there are three, four categories, right? There's exempt and then exempt subject to review by the director, which is a ministerial review, but it wouldn't just be automatically exempt, and then tier one and tier two. Yes. Okay. Um, and we received a lot of correspondence, but let me just ask two of them. Um, there were a number of letters from people in Kent Woodlands and the chart that was in the staff report was helpful to see what the difference is between the level of regulation that already exists in a lot of areas and, and uh, what would result under the SCA ordinance. But it's my understanding that in Kent Woodlands, and there were I think two different properties that wrote letters, that they're already subject to the, all the SCA policies <laughs> through design review and the only difference would be the restriction over uh, removal of vegetation and flat work, a patio or a driveway. That's correct. But everything else is already subject to the policies because design review is required and it's already subject to design review. That's correct. And then the other was a letter we received uh, from a planning consultant, a property in Paradise Drive. And I did print out the assessment. I couldn't figure out why the SCA would even apply to that property. It's on Paradise Drive. It's a parcel that extends out into the bay. Did you look at that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a reason that a parcel like that would fall under the SCA? Ordinance? Yeah. Um, actually, I had worked with that property owner. She had a question, the same question. There is a stream on the property, and the SCA ordinance does not apply to, t to the tidal extent of streams, but because of the topography, um, the stream in that location was not tidally influenced. So it would. Um, the SCA would apply to the stream on that property, you know, the 100 feet on either okay. side of the stream on that property. And I assume there are other mm -hmm. similar parcels along Paradise Drive, which I hadn't really thought about. I mean, I had known about Tam Valley and right. Lucas Valley and San Geronimo Valley, but I hadn't really thought about the Bayfront parcels. But. Yeah, and that property is um, in a planned district. So one thing that I had discussed with the property owner is that the planned district zoning already Requires brings a lot of, yeah, you know, like a new home or something it, under the review of the SCA policies. Well, again, like Kent Woodlands, the only difference would be the flat work and the vegetation. Correct, yes. Limitation. Okay. And then um, let me just m make the statement at this point. I mean, I, it seems to me that a lot of confusion is the fact that we call it setback when what in fact we're talking about is a permit area. I mean, a lot of times setback means you can't do anything within that, and a lot of letters <coughs> we received assumed that the property owners were being denied all use of their property within the setback, what's called a setback, but in fact it's only creating a permit area where you can use it subject to different permit requirements or in some cases even being exempt. But there is review, whereas now there isn't review. And it's not a case where a lot of people um, in their correspondence seem to imply that you couldn't use it. You know, half of my property would become unusable, but that isn't the case, right? Right. Okay. Commissioner Theron. Thank you. 
I want to make sure I understand the term cumulative. I, I couldn't tell from reading this whether it meant cumulative for one project, that is you remove some development within the setback, uh, within the permitted area, and you add some, but it's the sum of those that is, that you're, that is uh, looked at in, in the permit. But I was concerned about what, but if I come back the next year and want to do another 500 square feet, and, and what, if I just heard you correctly, you know, cumulative means over time. Right. You can't have Ever. more than 500. So that's going to be yes. monitored over time, or there'll be a, an initial um, uh, amount of development that's set as the baseline, and then a total of 500 square feet forever on that piece of property. Right. So once it goes to the 500 square foot point, any additional um, addition that's any additional addition, any further addition that someone would like to make to their structure would require a discretionary permit with the environmental review and the whole nine. Okay, thank you. I think it's important to point out it's, it's not you can't ever do it, it's you can't do it under tier one. If you want to get another 500 or 200 or 10, you're going to have to come in for a tier two and we can't just arbitrarily deny you. Um, Mr. Dickinson. Actually, I do have one more, um, and it's related to the drawing um, on the screen right now. If the addition was 500 square feet, or 499 square feet, um, that the way it's illustrated would qualify for tier one, right? Because it's not closer than the closest corner of the house. That's correct. This okay. illustration really shows an addition more than 500 square feet. It's not intended to cover the, the right. second it's part of that. Or, right, it's or, but it's not the um, closer than because it's clearly not closer than the closest corner of the house. Okay, that's correct. Anybody else? Um, I also, while, while we're on this business of design review, which has come up a couple times, um, note the chart that Tom staff provided us that illustrates, for people who aren't in the audience, are there, are there copies of this for the public? It contrasts um, what's required under this ordinance depending on whether you're in a conventional zoning district or a planned zoning district. Um, and it's, you know, for a lot of people like me and West Marin who are in planned districts, um, there's very little new in this ordinance that we're not subject to already through design review. Um, the main impact of this is going to be on um, conventional zoning districts, which is a fair amount of San Geronimo Valley. But one of the things that, that, that leapt out at me, um, Tom, um, was an alternative to this whole ordinance might have been just requiring design review for any construction development within an SCA similar to the way you did for uh, an Adramus stream setback development. So what is, was that a, a, a potential possibility? Thank you. That's an that's a excellent question. Um, if your commission recalls in 2002, 2003, we adopted the last substantive part of the SCA ordinance by requiring design review for development proposed on conventionally zoned vacant lots next to anadromous fish creeks. And that was a convenient way to require compliance with the county white plan policies. That is one option that you can consider, but we would not recommend that, and here's why. At the very, very early part of this um, at the April 1st meeting, and even prior to that, you know, we're trying to characterize the ordinance as one that's clear and simple. Right now, if you go through the design review process, let's say you're in Kent Woodlands, you have to be consistent with all of the countywide plan policies and programs. There's really a lot there to go from, and you know, you're really kind of um, putting your project in the hands of a planner, doing their best to interpret those policies and programs and what applies to your project and what doesn't. What we're hoping to accomplish with this proposed SCA ordinance is you can go to the development code itself, look at what level of review you need and what standards you need to meet, and that will give you a, a, a more a clearer path towards compliance. 
So that's really the primary reason why we decided not to use the design review route. And the second reason for that is, you know, design review is best um, safe for really design, community character type issues. It's really not a very effective tool to regulate protection of resources. You know, we've used it um, to bring in compliance with the cutting white plans resource policies. It's not an ideal way of um, really giving applicants and property owners a, a clear path towards, you know, how you can best meet um, the requirements and get approval to do development on the site. But it is something that your commission may want to consider as a, it would be a lot of, it would be a much simpler development code amendment um, because we will be focusing on just one section of the design review chapter to amend, you know, to broaden it to, to include um, developed lots as well. Um, if this ordinance pass is adopted, would there be any parcels that would be subject to the anatomous stream provision that wouldn't be subject to this? I mean, this is going to sweep all those anadromous stream parcels are going to be affected by this ordinance, aren't they? Yes, the anadromous fish streams are a subset of the SCA streams. And I want to say I think about 41% of all the SA, SCA map streams are also listed as anadromous. That, that's an, a listed, the streams are listed. Yes, they're, they're flagged in our GIS system as having importance for anadromous fish. Okay, the anadromous fish streams um, provision for design review applies only to new development on vacant lots. So it does not pick up additions to properties and all those things. That's correct. If we did design review for SCAs, would we also have that limitation to only vacant lots? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Well, would it have to be restricted only to new development on vacant lots within SCAs subject to design review? Or could anything that you come in to do? Well, I guess that is one option is to pursue a, an ordinance that only apply to no. proposed development of vacant properties. No. Do we have to do it that way? Would we have to restrict it only to vacant lots? No. No. Why did they do it that way for anadromous then? That was just the way it was done. Well, back in 2002, 2003, we um, had difficulty uh, using that approach to regulate developed properties. We received a lot of um, opposition from community groups to that one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and because at that time, it was shortly after the listing of the coho and the steelhead as endangered, we figured, you know, the board thought that the, the most, um, the biggest impacts would occur when you develop on vacant lots. So at that time, the decision was made that we will kind of phase in the SC ordinance by targeting vacant lots next to, next to anadromous fish creeks. We were also about to begin the update to the countywide plan and the board decided to kind of kick the rest of the SCA ordinance work or put it on hold until we've um, revised our countywide plan and the policies relative to SCAs. And here we are a decade later. <laughs> yes, it's, it won't go away. Okay. Um, does anybody on the commission want to pursue seriously this issue of using design review in lieu of the SCA ordinance? No. Why, do, why don't we wait till we get to the discussion and then? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's an issue we well, should address, but I'm I think asking, we should hear the testimony. Do we want to discuss it or do we want to just dispose of it now? You well, I think we should hear the testimony. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure anyone's going to advocate it, but they may, and we should at least have the benefit okay. of the testimony. All right, um, we're ready to move on.